Доброе утро, уважаемые коллеги. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. We are ready to open our session, network measurements and analysis. This area of activity is typical for large corporations and also not-for-profit organizations. And um, what uh, it requires is extensive expertise in the field of networking technologies and network topology, as well as the rules of the use of unique identifiers. So this is indeed an intricate um, field of knowledge and an extensive field of knowledge too. In order to prepare a specification, you have to be an expert, and then you have to be also an expert in order to interpret the specification to implement it and then interpret the results, the results of measurements. Uh, we will have several panelists. We will uh, start uh, with um, the presentation from RIPE NCC. Bastian Goslings will be our first speaker. Bastian, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just let me share my screen. So before I start, can you see uh, the, the first screen, the introduction screen, RPKI introduction and activity update? Can you see that? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Everything much. Everything works fine. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a pity I cannot uh, join you guys uh, uh, physically at the meeting, uh, but I'm, you know, proud and honored to be able to contribute in this uh, small way. Um, I will be giving a 15 minutes, so a short uh, introduction, as well as an activity date with regard to RPKI. And I will do, be doing that on behalf of the RIPE NCC. That's my employer. Uh, the RIPE NCC is a regional internet registry based in Amsterdam. And uh, I joined the public policy team in April last year. Um, and I mainly deal with public authorities, especially the Dutch ones, uh, the RIPNC being based in the jurisdiction of the Netherlands, but also more and more legisl legislative initiatives are uh, coming from the European Union angle, from Brussels. So those are the main areas that I'm involved in. So I'm not very technical, um, but I think, you know, routing security in terms of engaging with public authorities is a very important topic uh, as well. So brief outline of my presentation, I, I will briefly, you know, uh, touch on what the RIPE NCC is as a regional, regional internet registry, what we do, what we stand for. Uh, then BGP routing incidents and how RPKI fits into that as, a, as an instrument to improve routing security, the role of the RIPE NCC there. Um, maybe of interest, some uh, local regional uh, statistics, uh, what's happening in Russia in that area. And then um, some concrete things that the RIPE NCC is doing at the moment, both in the policy area with regard to RPKI, as well as technically. And um, yeah, if we have some time, you know, remaining for questions, happy to answer those. If I'm technically not able to, then I'm more uh, than glad to take them on board and follow up on those later with the help of technical expertise of colleagues of mine. So with regard to the RIPE NCC, as I mentioned, a regional internet registry, there are five of those uh, globally. And what we do is manage the allocation and registration of autonomous system numbers and IP address space in Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Central Asia. That also includes uh, the Russian Federation. Um, so what that means is that we ensure the unique holdership of those, those resources that we distribute um, amongst our members, so organizations that use those IP addresses and autonomous system numbers that need them and get them from the RIPE NCC, they become a member. There are more than 20,000 in our service region. Uh, the, the, this holdership uh, resources that have been distributed um, is registered in a public database, so everyone can see uh, who is holder of which resources. Um, there are di digital cer certificates that be can be uh, distributed to those members so they can sign their resources. I will go into that in more detail later because that applies to um, RPKI. So with regard to BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, the Border Gateway Protocol, the routing protocol of the internet, the protocol that helps all the tens of thousands individu individually managed networks, the autonomous systems that make up the entire internet, the network of networks, the, the protocol that they use to share information with each other, reachability of each other. This protocol, uh, the way that information is shared, assumes that everyone is telling uh, the truth. 
yeah, that what you receive is a fact. But is that always the case? Um, in a nutshell, this, this protocol does not include any built-in uh, security. Uh, any autonomous system can announce any uh, prefix. So also prefix, prefixes, IP address space that has been assigned to other autonomous systems. Anyone when announcing reachability of their networks can change, can make, uh, can, can prepend, you know, the, the autonomous system numbers in, um, in, a, in a so-called BGP AS path. So the, the path uh, that you need in order to reach a certain uh, 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 prefix. And these, prefi these prefixes, these announcements, um, that are that are spread out, that are communicated amongst the autonomous systems. If nothing uh, happens, then they are just accepted without validating that. So this means that if incorrect uh, uh, routing information is shared, then this will just be propagated all over the internet, and that can have consequences. Because of the trust built in, and basically you being able to announce anything you would like to announce, whether it's true or not, that means it's susceptible for incidents, things can go wrong. And even worse, um, if you have malicious intentions, then you can use this to abuse uh, for abusive behavior, like stealing cryptocurrency, intercepting traffic, eavesdropping, uh, maybe even you know trying to attempting to get other networks offline uh, completely. So that can have a real, uh, uh, a real significant impact. And considering the fact you know that we depend on these online uh, uh, services everything is being every any service is all, uh, being offered online uh, uh, nowadays and the criticality and the dependency has grown in such um dramatic uh, form that um the impact of incidents can be really severe so i, I touched upon the malicious aspect but um i think most of the uh, actually the incidents that happen are not necessarily because of bad intentions but because of um mistakes that are made in configuring uh, 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 sessions, in configuring uh, uh, filters, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things, you know, in order to make routing more secure is that operators need to verify the, 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 the information, the routing information they receive from others, from the other networks they're connected to, their peers. So can you actually establish whether a, a prefix uh, you now, that has been announced that you received, has this been originated by the legitimate holder or has it been tampered with? Has the AS path been tampered with? You know, uh, with, with when it comes to the announcements you receive, and if if, if you're able to validate that and not accept uh, invalid announcements, that can prevent propagation of incorrect routing information, and that as such can also prevent certain malicious activity, at least the impact of it. So, what about RPKI? Um, RPKI stands for Resource Public Key Infrastructure. How does this improve potentially improve security routing security? Well, what it basically does, um, it verifies or, or assures the association between uh, number of resources that have been delegated uh, to resource holders and uh, the, the, the routing statements that can be made. So which autonomous system number is actually entitled to announce certain IP prefixes. Most of the time, uh, resource holders will uh, state their own uh, autonomous system numbers and which uh, uh, prefixes they will uh, be announcing. So if others do so, then that's not valid. But they, you can also say, well, someone else is entitled to, if you, you can cryptographically also make a statement that someone else, another autonomous system number is um, entitled to uh, announce certain prefixes of yours. But anyway, this proves in a cryptographical way uh, the, the holdership. Um, these statements that are made, they're called uh, ROAs, uh, Route Origin Authorizations. They are then used by others to validate uh, the announcements they receive. So you receive a, a certain announcement from a peer of yours, and then using uh, ROAs that have been created by others, you can download these, and uh, these can be fed into your router in order to establish right whether announcements you receive are actually correct in terms of the originating uh, resource holder. And this then is also a stepping stone, what, stepping stone to what you would consider to be path validation, because I've been talking about RPKI in terms of origin validation. So it's actually a certain network entitled to announce a prefix, but um, there's more involved and there's an AS path that I also uh, early referred to. So uh, how it, does it work? Basically, RPKI attaches a digital certificate to IP addresses and AS numbers. And these can then be used, you know, to authorize the use of resources and validate them. So with regard to the uh, uh, RAR, like uh, uh, 
the RIPE NCC. Uh, RPKI relies on the five RIRs, the five global ones I refer to as being the trust anchor. So it's a hierarchical uh, structure. Uh, um, they, there's a trust anchor and, the, and that as a regional internet registry uh, will provide certificates to its resource holders and they then can sign their uh, their resources, uh, which are then called uh, ROAS that I earlier uh, referred to. So the, the, the end idea of this is that a global RPKI system, global because there are five RARs uh, that, that serve their members, resource holders globally, this would uh, 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 enhance routing security. It's quite a powerful uh, magazine, a mechanism. It can pre prevent BGP hijacks, uh, misorgination, so mistakes made when uh, configuring uh, uh, BGP, as well as route leaks. Um, it's currently used for the validating the, or the origin uh, autonomous system, as I referred to, but it's also a stepping tone to BGP uh, path validation, where RPKI can also uh, play a role. Um, the thing is, however, it's, or not however, but it is uh, opt-in. It's not something that is mandated use of RPKI. So uh, operators need to decide for themselves whether they use this or not, these technologies. And at the end of the day, if you really want a, a secure routing uh, uh, at a global level and have a real impact, then the more that join and use this uh, uh, technique, the more impact it will have. And it's a bit of a collection, collective action uh, uh, problem, as they, as they refer to, because initially when you start using it, it can be quite a hassle, a technical challenge to implement it, things might go wrong. And it's not immediately visible what the um, for yourself what the advantage of it is. So it really works if everyone does it. So these techniques have been around for a while. Currently, uh, say depending on, on which number you look at, uh, 35 to 40 percent uh, uh, of internet address space is covered by uh, RPKI. Um, but again, you know, if, if more and more networks use it, then the impact of BGP hijacking can be significantly uh, uh, reduced more than it is now. So when it comes to some uh, uh, numbers, I really, really, really quickly, rough and dirty, you know, some things I, uh, I looked at. Uh, APNIC provides uh, statistics and then gives you some, in terms of color, uh, uh, how far, you know, uh, certain regions or countries uh, 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 have implemented uh, RPKI. So when it comes to the auth authorization uh, part, this is like uh, on a global perspective, uh, uh, the color. Um, but maybe more interesting, uh, at least also for us, when we look at uh, the ripe stats, so then uh, then we at least know that we are looking at the numbers that we have ourselves, the ripe NCC, so that when it comes to our own uh, members, um, and in this case, uh, the, the Russian networks, um, then it's also like close to 40% uh, or a bit more than 40% of uh, IPv4 space in this case, it has been uh, covered by ROAS. It's less for IPv6, it's around 10%. Uh, there might be a number of reasons for that, but looking at um, our IPv4 and also compare that to other countries, I think, you know, Russia is on the right track. It's also nice, you know, you can see a trend. There has been quite a spike uh, leading up to 2020, and then the number is growing. So I, think, I, I guess that the, the you guys are doing uh, are doing quite well. Um, and this, this is actually, this refers to delegated space, so uh, a space that has been uh, allocated by the RIPE NCC to uh, Russian networks. And um, it, it's not referring to uh, actual space that is being announced and visible in the, in the routing table, but it gives a good indication, I guess, of, of the trend. Um, on a global scale, uh, and this is from an American uh, uh, website, when you look at um, yeah, looking at all the, the space covered by ROAS and you would then you look at it uh, uh, at everything that is announced and what is valid and what is uh, uh, invalid and unknown. Then you also see the numbers of, of valid statements. Uh, they're, they're growing uh, and the, the, the not found, uh, the, the unknown ones uh, are, are becoming uh, becoming less. Well, obviously the invalid ones um, are, are a minority. That's a good thing. And the invalid ones, of course, um, the idea would be that if you use RPKI and, and you see that certain announcements are invalid, that you drop those. And if everyone does so, then they will not further propagate uh, uh, on, the, on the internet. So briefly, what uh, the RIPE NCC is doing uh, at, at the moment, well, there are two angles, both uh, on one hand, the policy uh, side of things, and on the other hand, the technical. Um, well, from the policy side, it might be of interest, if you're not aware, uh, looking at the RIPE-NC strategy for, for 2022 to 2026. Um, RPKI is also one of the, the, the big topics. 
and we aim to operate a resilient externally audit auditable and secure resource certification as a trust anchor and uh, i will go you know in the technical parts to some activities we're doing there but also very important is that we uh, focus on uh, promoting the use of uh, best practices for internet uh, resources and standards so it's ipv6 and in this case rpki and uh, probably you know this this small talk is also contributing to that when reaching out to our uh, russian uh, members and the Russian technical internet community. Um, one of the things, you know, we, we engage with a lot of uh, stakeholders across our uh, service region. We deal with public authorities. We deal, of course, with the private sector, with the operators, right? Uh, we give a lot of uh, uh, trainings. So we've actually been quite successful in the Middle East, you know, to get the numbers uh, up. So that's a good thing. Um, in terms of training, we have developed new routing security uh, courses. You can take those uh, physically, um, but also in the academy, uh, 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 online academy that we have, you, have, you can do them uh, uh, free and uh, with, without any charge. So if you make an, uh, an account there, then um, that might be useful to have, have a look at. And um, in terms of uh, the the physical ones or the online ones, you know that we do with a with a real trainer. Uh, always open, you know, for requests if, if people uh, would appreciate, you know, a session, and uh, we can always discuss that and organize something for you. Um, in terms of uh, outreach, when it comes to the the topic of routing security, we uh, are hosting um, a workshop at the Global uh, Internet Governance Forum in uh, in October, focused at um, how to improve the adoption uh, of routing security best practices and RPKI specifically. Um, and there, you know, we will deal with other stakeholder groups from governments, from civil society, uh, from the pub pub public private sector operators, you know, how to, to, to get to see what, what their different perspectives are on things also from different regions and how we can work together to improve uh, the situation. So that was it uh, for me. I'm slightly over time, but um, if there is some room for questions, I would be happy, you know, to take them on board. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bastian. Do we have any questions to the speaker? Thank you for your presentation and a question about, question about uh, RPKS statistic. Uh, does Ripen CC uh, have uh, any statistic uh, that shows uh, how the technology prevents BGP hijacks in real time, maybe with ripe risk services? Thank you. I cannot hear anything, so I don't know if... <laughs> Does RIPE NCC have any statistics uh, proving that uh, RPKI can prevent um, BGP hijacking, for instance? Uh, well, statistics, um, I, I, I decided not to, to include, it's a good question, I decided not to include that here in the presentation, but I have some uh, backup, sl backup slides which are included in the slide pack that refer to a number of uh, quite big uh, incidents over the last couple of years um, that do sh demonstrate, you know, the, the severe impact that this can have. And um, I was actually talking to the Dutch, uh, to some go Dutch government uh, officials uh, yesterday, and uh, for them, I think it was in 2015, uh, IP address space of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs was uh, hijacked. And uh, that gave them such a scare. And in order to avoid this in the future happening again, you know, they stepped up and made uh, the usage of RPKI mandatory for Dutch uh, public uh, authorities. Um, so just as an, uh, that's just a recent example, uh, talking to people about that, um, that it, it, it can be a wake up call, right? Like. Uh, it's not always visible in terms of, you know, for end users that these type of incidents happen, and that's probably a good thing, and most of them are, are by mistake. But if something really severe happens, then it can have quite a, an impact, you know, either in terms of um, when it's malicious attempts, but also just systems breaking and certain services not being available anymore. Um, so again, I, I refer to the um, uh, the additional slides I put in, in the slide back, and, and if any other questions, you know, pop up there, then more than happy, you know, if you can relay the questions and take them on board and have a follow-up discussion on that. Thank you very much, Bastian. Uh, okay, so let's move on, and our next speaker is Johan der Best with RIPE NCC. 
Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, where is it? Um, can you see my uh, presentation? Uh, I can. Thank you. Maybe. Yes, everything's uh, fine. Okay. Good, good. Um, hi, I'm uh, Johan Terbeest. I am uh, a senior software engineer uh, on the Vibe Atlas team. I've uh, been doing this for the last 10 years, which is almost uh, the full uh, lifetime of Atlas, but not quite. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm going to give a, a short introduction to Vibe Atlas, what it is, what it does, um, why we built it, and also give you a quick update on uh, some of the changes that we are going to make in the next six months to up to two years. Uh, so you have a little bit of an idea of the direction that we are that we are taking. Uh, this is the, the map, as you know, hopefully, Rap Atlas is a, a global measurement uh, platform. So, um, we are a officially a global active measurement uh, platform. The goal for Web Atlas is to uh, make the, the internet reachability visible. So we are a topology network. We look at how you get from A to B on the internet. We are not looking at things like bandwidth or uh, uh, other uh, issues. We are purely about is thing, are things reachable on the internet. Um, Red Atlas uh, uses probes, little hardware devices that are hosted by volunteers, and all the data that we gather is uh, publicly available. So, um, Red Atlas, as I said, it's a measurement platform. So, what we create is measurements. We have two types of measurements. There are the built-in measurements. Those are measurements run by every single probe that is connected. Um, and then we have uh, the, the user-defined measurements, which you can run yourself if you uh, host a probe. Um, and then we also run some, some specialized uh, measurements. For instance, we have anchors, which is a special type of, uh, of probe. Uh, they run their own uh, measurements, and those, that data is also available for you. So as I said, we have probes and anchors. Uh, we have currently 12,000 probes connected, uh, of which uh, 800 roughly uh, Vibe Atlas anchors. We collect 15,000 results per second uh, currently, and we have 35,000 ongoing measurements running. We have many more short-term measurements. You can also run like a, a one-off measurement. Um, there's many more of those, but 35,000 con continuous measurements are, are running on the system. Um, in addition to the two hardware types uh, of probes, we also have the software probes, uh, which is essentially a software package that works like a regular probe and can be installed on uh, different machines. You can install it uh, in a VM, you can install it on a router, on a server, um, any Pretty much anything can, can run it. Many people run it on a Raspberry Pi, for instance. Uh, we are supporting officially CentOS 8. Uh, that will become uh, Oracle uh, uh, Linux uh, in the future, but currently it's still CentOS 8. We will also officially start supporting Debian 9, 10, and 11. Um, it will become uh, packages on both of those systems. So it will simply be uh, a regular install on how you install it in, in either CentOS or Debian. Uh, we have a Raspbian version. We have, have Docker images available. Uh, you can run it on a Taurus router, for instance, as well. Uh, but those are not officially supported. So if you run into issues, you need to, the community to help you. Um, Currently, we are out of uh, hardware probes, and in general, for people uh, in uh, in the, the Russian area, I would uh, I would consider uh, that you think about running a software probe if you are interested. Um, it's been really difficult uh, to to ship probes uh, to Russia in general, um, 
And uh, currently, we don't even have hardware probes available until January. So if you want to run a probe, uh, please consider running a, a software probe. We'd really appreciate it. So um, if you want to create a measurement, for instance, why would you do this? Um, let's say that your problem is somebody cannot reach your server. Yeah, you get a comment. Somebody says, I cannot reach your web server, and I'm in Germany, and it doesn't work. Then you can schedule measurements, pings, trace routes from probes worldwide to your server. So that is what makes Atlas unique, is that you can, from your own location, measure the connectivity as it is to any destination on the internet from anywhere where we have probes. And as you saw in the, uh, the map in the beginning, the first slide that I showed you, uh, we have probes pretty much uh, worldwide. Where we have people, there will be probes. Um, other things you can measure is, for instance, packet loss on, on links. Uh, you can do an Anycast deployment. You can test DNS. You can test SSL connections, uh, etc. There's lots of uh, things you can test. Um, to run your own measurements, we use a credit system. So every measurement uh, costs a number of credits. Like one ping result is 10 credits, a trace route is 20 credits. Uh, we do this to make the, the system fair, so one person cannot easily overload uh, the system. It also allows us to have a spending limit that people cannot just do too much uh, things. Um, in general, it, 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 uh, it works well. It helps uh, keep the system stable. So, of course, that means that you need credits if you want to, uh, to run measurements. So how do you get those credits? Uh, there are several ways. You can host a Ripe Atlas probe. The moment that it's connected, it starts collecting credits. You get roughly 26,000 credits per day that it's uh, connected. Uh, you can also get credits by being a Ripe NCC member. Every member gets 1 million free credits uh, a month, regardless of whether they're hosting probes. You can host uh, an anchor, which generates up to five to 10 times the number of credits of a uh, Ripe Atlas probe. And if that is still not enough, you can also sponsor probes. Uh, you will get then the, the uptime credits from the sponsored probes added to, uh, to your account. So an uh, overview of what the, the, the credits look like. Um, you see the, the, your balance, how many credits you have. You can transfer credits to other users. You can also share access to your credits so other users can use your credits to create their measurements. Uh, measurement results. If you create a, a measurement, this is a list of all the measurements that you have created in this particular case. So you can see that you created measurements to Wikipedia in this case. Uh, your ping measurements, trace routes, uh, etc. So the, the types that we have are ping, trace route, DNS, HTTP, SSL, NTP. Wi-Fi isn't really uh, active currently, so that will be removed in a future version. Uh, and then the anchoring measurements, which is the mesh between the, the 800 anchors that we have. We have different visualizations available. So once you run your measurements, so you can see the RTT on, on a ping measurement, for instance. You can do that in a list. You can see that on a map. We see the, the probes that are involved in the measurement and the RTTs that uh, they have. Or you can use latency mon, which compares uh, the trends of the, the RTT. So instead of seeing the current RTT, you can see how the, the RTT uh, developed over time. Additionally, for trace routes, we have a trace mon, which is very similar to, uh, to latency mon. It gives you the trend of how the traffic uh, went from A to B. You can sort this by AS, you can sort this by country um, to, to get an idea of how your, your traffic uh, uh, went. Then you, we have IP map. Um, the example here is uh, showing a trace route on a map. Uh, which is still uh, possible, but IP map is moving to an API only service. So in the future, you're going to have to build your own visualizations on top of the data that we provide. Um, DNS, similar, 
uh, visualization. Uh, you can see on the map, you can see the response rates uh, of the different uh, DNS servers. Um, when you create your own measurements, you can use the API to or the website to download the, the data that it generated. Like I said, all data is publicly available. So every measurement, you can download all the data uh, yourself. Um, you can uh, set the time so you don't have to get all the data for the measurement because some measurements run for all, all more than 12 years. Uh, that will be, be hundreds of gigabytes of data. So instead, you can set a time frame and say, like, for instance, I want only the data for the last day. Uh, we also have a part of the Web Atlas data is available on BigQuery, the, the Google platform, um, which allows you to use a more SQL-like query language to get uh, data out of um, uh, right out of Web Atlas. Uh, the links are in the in the slide in case you are interested to uh, to use it. Uh, additionally, we have a command line interface. So if you don't like uh, using Web Atlas uh, using the, the browser, you can use the, the command line. Uh, they are, um, it's a Python tool. It runs on Linux and uh, Mac OS X. Uh, there is a Windows version. It should run. Uh, so um, it essentially allows you to run ping commands and trace route commands, for instance. Uh, which give you an output that is very similar to the, the commands that most network engineers are, uh, are used to. Uh, the CLI is completely open source. Uh, you can find all the documentation online uh, and the uh, tools are hosted on GitHub. Um, most people care about uh, security of their probes. You don't want to put uh, a probe in your network if it's not secure. Um, so uh, we make sure that uh, that the probes are very, very uh, secure. Uh, they have, for instance, no open ports. They don't listen to your local traffic. They don't create any measurements unless you specifically tell them to create a measurement. Um, the probes themselves connect to our infrastructure. And the way that it is works is that the probe is the one initiating the connection. So it's not possible to go from the outside to the probe. The probe has to come to us. So it's impossible to try to, to hack a probe from the outside. You will not, uh, you will not succeed. Uh, in addition, uh, all the measurement code, so the firmware that runs on the probe is publicly available uh, if you want to check that. Um, here are some uh, interesting links for you to follow if you want to read up uh, more things about Ripe Atlas. So the future of Ripe Atlas, um, as I said, we've been um, running it for uh, almost 12 years, well, about 12 years now. Um, and we are currently making uh, a lot of changes. Uh, the changes fall into two main categories, front-end changes and back-end changes. Uh, the, the front end changes are that we're going to reconsider a lot of the stuff on the UX side. We want to simplify probe management. We might make it easier for you to transfer your probes and your measurements. So essentially take everything that you have and give it to someone else. Um, we will make it available that you can request credits as a researcher through Ripe Atlas. Uh, so if you are want to do research using Ripe Atlas, but you need millions of credits and you cannot possibly host that many probes to get those credits, you can uh, request the credits from us. We will happily sponsor your research. Um, and the UX will also make it available that you can request elevated permissions. A lot of researchers especially run into issues uh, with permissions where they don't allow, we don't allow them in the default settings to use enough probes or get enough measurement results. Um, right now you have to come to us personally, uh, but we'll make that uh, more easily available to you. On the UI side, Atlas will become a real front end uh, web application that will also uh, mean that all the promotional stuff will go away. It will purely be an, an app um, that will also make it possible that it will run much, much better on a mobile device, whether that's a, a tablet or a phone. 
we are for the first time in uh, the life of Vibe Atlas, we are going to make a change to the backend data and how we store it. Um, currently, we have all the data from the beginning of time till now available in our HBase cluster. Um, and that is effectively is not scaling right now. The, the different use cases where some people want to have the data uh, from the last month and other people want to say, I want to download hundreds of gigabytes of data from 2016 uh, interferes with each other and it makes the system unstable for everybody. So what we'll be doing is we'll, the data will be split into hot and cold storage. The HBase cluster will only contain the last month of data, which is what 95% of our users uh, need. Uh, all the other data will be available using cold storage. Um, the from the uh, API perspective and the website perspective, nothing will change. All the data is available the same way. No data will be deleted. Um, it's just conceptually, uh, you get it from a different location, essentially. Um, we will also add many more APIs. This is mainly because of the overhaul of the UI. Uh, we need everything available in APIs now, which is the nice benefit that a lot more interesting stuff will be available in APIs than it used to be. Um, and we're working on new measurements. For instance, uh, soon we will have uh, start TLS measurements and we're also working on uh, other uh, more protocol uh, related measurements. For instance, SNMP is something that is still being discussed and most likely HTTP measurements will become publicly available soon. Uh, other improvements is that we will extend the amount of built-ins that we run. Currently, like I said, we run mostly to root servers, some of the Atlas infrastructure, and a few other locations. Um, we will start some measurements to common targets like Google, Facebook, and several of the most common, uh, commonly used CDNs, um, which means that you don't have to run these measurements by yourself anymore you can simply use the, the ongoing measurement if you want to see how probes get to, let's say, uh, the Google uh, DNS, then uh, you just have a measurement available for that. We're also going to overhaul the probe page to show more interesting things to the probe host. You can think here about things like uh, the ISP that you're connected to will gather statistics um, on uh, all the other probes that we know that connect to the same ISP uh, and is your probe connecting in the, with using the same quality of service that other people from the same ISP gets, things like that. Um, we are also working on a new uh, measurement creation page. Uh, the new version will be a lot faster. We'll have much, much improved probe selection and uh, also way better support for finding existing measurements. So if you type in, uh, create a measurement and we say, hey, we already have this, then we'll, we'll simply ask you, maybe you, start, you can use this existing measurement. You don't have to create your own. Uh, the measurement creation page will be available for beta testing by September 18. Um, and we don't have a link yet. The link for the beta testers will be made available on our uh, mailing list. There probably will also be a Vibe Labs article uh, about it. And that's it for me. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, Johan. Um, do we have any questions? My name is uh, Evgeny Kuskevich. I'm from RIPN. Uh, Jochen, you mentioned that uh, not only hardware probes, but also software probes are available. How about making a probe which looks like a mobile app uh, for Android, for instance, and uh, iOS? Um, an interesting question, and it's come up a lot. Um, the, the main issue is that uh, currently, um, we assume that probes are connected as much as possible. We kind of want probes to be connected 24-7. And 
for things like running it on an Android phone or something like that, um, that won't, of course, be possible. Um, it would, however, and, and this is why the question comes up, it would, however, be very interesting to be able to test cellular networks. So um, there, there is no technical uh, limitation. There is no reason why we couldn't do it. We're just a little bit worried about getting an influx of, of potentially hundreds of thousands of probes that then uh, essentially keep coming online, offline, and make the system uh, a bit unstable if somebody else wants to uh, run measurements. So it's it's something that we're thinking about, but in the current way that we we use probes, it's not really feasible yet. But I'm not excluding it for the future. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Johan. Well, uh, there are no further questions. Thank you very much for being with us and see you next time. Okay, now our next speaker. Uh, and who's our next speaker? It's going to be Dmitry Kovalenko. Hello, colleagues. My name is Dmitry Kovalenko. I'm with MSKIX. I am in charge of DNS. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ICANN uh, MOS API interface. Uh, so, what is MOS API? It's an interface that stores data that collects the that is collected by the ICANN monitoring system that controls the service level of the domains that are registered under the new GTLD uh, program, and also you can enable this uh, monitoring for CCTLDs upon request. You can find additional information at their website, and MSKIX offers several services for TLDs, including any cost DNS, and upon agreement with regist uh, uh, um, registries, uh, we have access to this API, so we can uh, build reports on the basis of the collected data. And now um, to the main uh, part of my presentation. There is an SLA matrix. It's part of the new GTLD agreement. Uh, the specification 10, it's uh, mandatory for the registries uh, that operate under the new GTLD program. And if the threshold value is exceeded, then certain procedures uh, will be launched uh, against the registry and the service. The data will be collected from data escrow. The data will be shared with the operator, emergency um, operator uh, that will support uh, the uh, service in crisis for a while. Now, um, how does the distributed uh, probe network uh, of ICANN controls uh, for these parameters? This network is located around the world, and we as a DNS operator are primarily interested in the DNS services, DNSSEC, DNS. Now, let's take a closer look at this network and the measurements that it uh, performs for the measurement cycle to be considered a success. Uh, the minimum number of active testing probe nodes uh, must participate in the test cycle. There are about 40 probes, uh, that number changes all the time. Uh, so if 51% or more of the testing probe nodes uh, see uh, a monitored service as unavailable at a given time, the service will be considered unavailable. And the service will be considered down if three consecutive test cycles, uh, one minute apart, have been unsuccessful. Uh, 
These numbers apply to the DNS services. Uh, for other uh, services, the numbers uh, or the values are slightly different. Now, you may be wondering where the probes are located. Uh, most of the probes are in Western Europe. You can see that they are spread uh, across different region, uh, regions and continents. Uh, in Russia, there is just one probe. Uh, it's located in Moscow. In terms of the network topology, uh, this is how it looks like. There's also IP addresses of the probes are located in 11 ASs. So um, you see that uh, here we have about 10 uh, unique uh, organizations. Most of them are on the networks of large uh, hosters at large hosting sites that geographically are spread out across the world. So this geography, this distribution enables the monitoring system to see about two thirds of the uh, MSKIX platform network. Now, what about the other third? One third of our DNS infrastructure that stays invisible is in Russia, and it has regional connectivity. Regional connectivity means that uh, they are connected to a local IX, and it doesn't have access to the global internet. Uh, there is no IP transit happening on it. So, but to uh, to make sure that we see the remaining parts, we use this self-testing network. The self-testing network is deployed at hosting providers that are located at the same um, uh, hosting providers that host ICANN probes uh, or somewhere close. And also we use our own uh, offices, our own um, infrastructure in the Russian regions. So as a result, uh, we get a network that looks something like that. And uh, this network enables uh, more informed reports. Here you can see uh, joint locations, both of ICANN uh, probes and MFKIX probes. So uh, I've added Russian regions onto the map. And so uh, knowing this, we can better, be better control our infrastructure. The self-testing network um, provides not only for control capabilities, but also enables additional diagnostics. In case of any incidents or issues, we can uh, use um, uh, trace routes to um, identify the bottlenecks, or um, we can um, measure the size of the DNS response, or we can do uh, other analysis of uh, the data coming from verified sources. As to um, more um, complicated cases, uh, or if we need uh, an even greater geographical representation, we use RIPE Atlas. They have an extensive number of probes around the world, and they provide a wonderful functionality for additional diagnostics. So uh, the data contained in uh, MOS API uh, are featured as JSON files. It's a text that's formatted as a JSON. This data is not uh, very much analyzable, so we download the data, we store it in our database, and then we use the visualization uh, tools to build our reports here on the slide to the left, you can see one such report. And on the right, you see this same report, but uh, it's based on uh, the data from MSKIX uh, probes. So one of them is MOS API, the other one is an, an MSKIX uh, report. Uh, and we share these reports with the interested parties. Now, um, here you can see the number of probes uh, uh, engaged in measurements at any uh, given point in time. Uh, you can see the worst RTT for the cloud for IPv4 and also IPv6. 
we have the same data for IPv6. That's it on measurements. But um, to um, conclude my presentation, I just wanted to remind you that the MSKIX office offers uh, services that might be uh, interesting to TLD registries. And these services are localized in Russia. We offer uh, data escrow and Pentecost DNS, and you can read more about these services at our website. Here is the QR code, and here are the links. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Vadim Mikhailov from uh, cctld.argu. I've got two questions. So you are getting data from MOS API in real time, or uh, there is some latency? So there is an SLA a breach. Um, uh, what is the gap, uh, the time gap between the incident uh, and uh, the time when you register it. We don't register incidents. There is a latency of about five minutes. So I'd say two to five minutes, depending. On uh, certain settings. And then uh, it takes several minutes to verify the data. We use additional data not for monitoring purposes, but for uh, analysis. Okay, another question. Were there any deviations between most API data and your uh, network of probes data? Were there any deviations? Were there any uh, mismatches between the data? No, well, our objective is not to replicate the data or reproduce the data that is collected elsewhere. Yes, we can send uh, similar queries, but uh, we we aren't measuring, uh, you know, second for second. We aren't measuring at the same time, and we are measuring on different parts of the network at any point in time. But no, I mean, like a major contradiction or a major deviation. No, nothing like this. No, not really. So uh, we have never tried to control one data with uh, other data. If there is an outlier, then yes, there would be an, investiga an investigation, but otherwise, no. Any other questions, colleagues? I have a question, if I may. You said that uh, and um, SLA breach leads to a barrel initiation, the procedure, a certain procedure initiation. So all these monitorings, uh, we need them uh, in order to understand whether this procedure needs to be invoked uh, or, I don't know, I can, uh, did it ever use the IBRO procedure on anyone? Oh, well, there was one case, and probably it's the only one. Um, and I remember it was in 2017. There was a dot weddings uh, domain issue. It's uh, It was some service for newlyweds, and something went wrong there. And then they looked, uh, as far as I remember, this domain is no longer on the TLD list. So probably this procedure was invoked, it was applied, and the domain uh, was suspended. The comment is off the microphone and can't be translated. Um, in the absence of further questions, Dmitry, thank you so much. And we are going to move to our next presentation. Uh, which will be delivered by Olga Baskakova from CTLV.RU. Hello, colleagues, can you hear me? It'll, uh, it'll take me a couple of seconds to share the screen. Please bear with me. I hope you can see the slides. No, not yet. No, you need to start displaying the slides. 
you know, F5, impressive. Okay, now, now, now it's on. Everything is okay. Okay, it's better now. Wonderful. Well, usually I present uh, domain security related projects, but now I'm speaking uh, at the session that's dedicated to measurements. For me, it's an honor to be uh, a panelist together with other technical experts. My presentation will be more down to us, but I hope you will still find it curious. Um, movement is alive. These are the words of Aristotle. And when we stop moving towards a new goal, we start to die in a slow death. No one wants to die. And I'm sure that um, most of the colleagues here are interested in domain statistics. It means that they visited at least once, but probably uh, many more times. You visited startdom.ru uh, website. It was launched more than 10 years ago. It's now supported by the TCI because we are a technical operator for .ru, .rf, and .su. And the employees of the coordination center, myself included, uh, we go uh, to this website on a daily basis to look at the data. And there is lots of data available there in all kinds of dimensions, uh, which is great. Uh, it's just that in recent years, we began to realize that to develop harmonically, we need to expand our perspective on the data and to evaluate the data from new perspectives, new points of view, and um, interpret them in new ways. So on this uh, journey, uh, we went through several iterations in 2000, um, uh, 21, a monthly report for registrars was developed. And in 2023, we started getting new tools a new from new reports that were based on registry database. And then uh, we developed a huge, uh, uh, we started working on the new dashboard for visualization. Uh, uh, we expect it to be launched in 2024. We are going to use a Yandex data lens, uh, which is um, a well-known tool in Russia. Uh, we uh, organized kind of a tender and uh, Yandex uh, is in the Russian language. So it's already localized and uh, Yandex data lens is uh, partially free. Um, well, or conditionally free. Well, I mean, at first you can uh, use it free of charge. Um, but when your data sets grow, uh, of course, uh, it becomes a paid service. I will not discuss the tool itself, but uh, instead I'm going to show you what can be done with the help of this tool and what we are already doing it. Uh, since we need to understand uh, um, how our registry and our domain space features versus other uh, registries and domain spaces, we collect and uh, review statistics on a global scale. You can see that compared to global trends that are you and other rev uh, are less volatile. I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but um, this is what we uh, see, and uh, this is the information on which re we rely in our work. Here you can see um, the map uh, of how the domain names are spread across Russia. We have uh, uh, a similar map for the world, but now you're looking at the Russian regions map. Uh, the reports uh, give us not just the total number of domains in different regions, but also uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, field of application, whether they are websites uh, uh, that are parked, uh, websites used for redirect, etc. So this is, a, this is a, another important bit of uh, information. Uh, an even uh, more useful map uh, and an informative map is the heat map of growth in the regions. Access to the statistics that helps you uh, assess the growth rates in different regions allows us to assess uh, performance of our marketing campaigns. Uh, you, just by, you know, um, 
uh, taking a glance at this map, you immediately see how efficient your marketing campaigns are in different regions. We also need to understand the role and the weight of the registrars in our domain name system and uh, the dynamics of their performance. And that's why we collect and process statistics on the distribution of domain names across uh, registrars. On this slide, you can see the bars. This di diagram shows us the total number of domain names in the zone and top five registrars and the share of the total number of uh, the domain names that belongs to each registrar. Uh, and a similar uh, chart, uh, but um, this time uh, it looks differently. It's a different uh, uh, visuals because we know that uh, different uh, people prefer uh, different types of visualization. So it's very easy now to visualize the data in a couple of clicks in a new way. Now on the registrars. We want to uh, understand our registrars better since they are our clients. That's why we produced reports to evaluate the domain names belonging to each uh, registrar by category. In that view, that ref, most of the domain names are registered by individuals, not organizations. Uh, but uh, registrars all have different business models. Of course, we were aware of this in the past, but now we just not simply know it, we can prove it. And we can also observe the dynamics, uh, the changes in the customer base of the registrars and uh, this, 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 the split of the shares of individuals and organizations. And you can also uh, compare how different registrars use the domain names. We know, we, we do not uh, just assume, we, we know um, how the registrars are developing their business models, we know who their customers are and uh, what are the purposes of their customers because uh, some people uh, use the domains for websites, others uh, use domains to park them. It's important uh, that we know it uh, again in order to uh, target our marketing campaigns better and to develop develop some customized proposals or offer national to different uh, registrars to promote the domain in our domain zones. Of course, in addition to those indicators and metrics, um, like uh, the uh, type of use, uh, we also uh, collect data on the basic indicators like the number of registrations, delegations, removals, suspensions, whatever. It's uh, very easy to collect and assess this data. The total number of domain names, the total um, number of registrations uh, is shown on the, on the graph and the uh, different types of transactions uh, with the domain names per a registrar. Over here, you can see the charts uh, on reg.ru. It's the largest Russian registrar. And you can tell that its share in total number of transactions is very high. This is general statistics uh, for the domain zone. The number of registrations of the domain names, uh, this is monthly dynamics, and also um, you can look at the data uh, by years. Now in 2023, uh, the performance is higher than in the previous year. And according to our forecast, 2023 will be uh, much more productive than 2022. On the next slide, uh, you can see the dynamics and the number of registrations, that's uh, registrations, uh, removals of the domain names and total uh, growth in the .ru zone. Uh, from this graph, you can tell that uh, again, 2023 is, has been growing um, with positive uh, numbers. We have been growing since the start of the year. 
А на последних двух слайдах я вам хочу показать... So, uh, what you've seen so far was not surprising. These are standard reports, standard uh, charts. And now I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite um, reports. It's our know-how. This is the data that we started collecting a few years back. This is analysis of our domain space depending on the weights uh, of the registrants. Uh, we need to know our clients and not just the registrars, but also the end users, the registrants who register the domain names we consider to be our clients. We need to understand who are the, these people and uh, why they register domain names, what are their uh, objectives. Most of the domains are registered by the users that have one to ten domains which is only to be expected. Well, the majority of the registrants uh, register one or two domain names. That's half of all the zone. And the remaining half of the zone is distributed between the players uh, who um, have different weights. We started gathering the statistics in 2014 when the rule zone uh, went into decline, uh, we need to investigate the reasons for, for this um, downwards trend. And here you can see the different, different dynamics in different categories of the registrants. In 2017, for example, in data view and data ref, the prices were reviewed, the prices were increased. And as a result, um, this uh, led to prolonged um, decline um, in the number of registrations. And mostly um, uh, this decline was driven by the domain areas, uh, by, by the registrants who had anywhere between 500 and 1,000 uh, domains registered. In 2022, it was not a growth in one category and a decline in a different category, but rather there was a migration from one category into another. Some users who held large portfolios uh, made these portfolios even bigger. And uh, many of these registrants uh, uh, stopped being large. Uh, uh, registrants and uh, and uh, became very large registrants. In 2023, we see growth across all uh, uh, categories of our registrants, which makes us very happy. So I um, um, this uh, brings my presentation to the close. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them. In any, in any case, you know how to contact me. Questions, please. Olga, on two, uh, oh, on two slides, uh, uh, there are a couple of outlines. It's a registrar. Yeah, one of the largest registrars. I know what you are talking about. It's a registrar um, who will love DLE. Uh, this uh, registrar has a peculiar business model, uh, which is not uh, it's sales names that are you, which um, uh, which is quite uh, uh, which is quite um, well. The, their business model uh, corresponds to the rules. It doesn't violate the rules. Uh, sale names is the largest of the registrars that focuses on uh, domains for parking. There are other registrars like this, but I just wanted to demonstrate that uh, uh, there are indeed various business models out there. That's why we uh, gather this data to understand the differences between the registrars. If they were all the same, it would be quite boring. I could have shown you just one graph and be done. Olga, thank you. And the last speaker in the session is Pavel Hramtsov. Can you please speak into the microphone? All right. While the presentation has been uploaded, and the way of introduction, let me just say that uh, uh, we all uh, depend very much on the methodology used, on uh, the approach um, 
uh, exercised. And I'm going to give you a case of DNS resolver to illustrate this idea. Uh, Georgi, the presentation is already open there. You just need to share it. Olga, can you please enable your camera? Yes, I'm here. Well, Pavel is setting up his presentation, and your slides, oh, well, your slides are wonderful, uh, but um, uh, I, I, the intelligence that you have is uh, even more exciting. I understand how much work goes into it, but um, in practical terms, I mean, how do you use the, uh, uh, the um, output of your intelligence? Well, in practical terms, uh, for, um, for us to be able to use these data in practice, for instance, to build our financial plans, we need to understand the trends. We need to see where the zone is moving. Uh, do we need to plan for, for growth or do we need to, uh, uh, to plan um, uh, for, uh, for a decline? What are your plans, Olga? Is your system fully done? Well, no, actually, I'm currently preparing a specification for the developers. I want them to uh, design a dashboard for the data. I hope very much that already this year we'll be able to produce some uh, visualization and to automate data processing. The graphs that I demonstrated, they are uh, today, they are built using Yandex data lens and we do it with our hands. It's, it's all manual work. But in general, I plan to build a big portal. Oh, that's my dream. I want there to be a big portal uh, for the uh, registry employees so that they can decide on marketing strategy uh, to build trends uh, for the budgeting uh, process. And as a next step, uh, some of this por uh, portal can be opened uh, to registrars because uh, right now we compile monthly reports for the registrars and we do it again with our, our own hands. This is all manual and this takes a lot of time. And as a third step, uh, the plans further down the line. Um, maybe um, this portal can also be made available to the registrants. It's a lot of work. Yes, indeed, it's a lot of work. And the more I uh, do it, uh, the bigger the project becomes. Yes, there is a comment from the floor. I also wanted to add something to Olga's comment. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, you see, whenever we see some fluctuations, uh, maybe a growth or a reduction in the number of domain registrations, we need to understand why this is happening. Uh, what are the root causes? Uh, are all um, registrars suffering, or is it just one, two registrars that are affecting the dynamics of the whole market? So it's not like they are uh, 
absolutely new sets of data, but instead we would like to present the data across new dimensions and the new cross sections, you know, uh, we'd like to, uh, for the data to be analyzed uh, in a more granular way. But, um, these trends, do you see that the local trends uh, correspond to the international trends? Uh, have you carried an analysis like this? Yes, of course. I collect statistics uh, for, for the main uh, CCTLDs uh, during many years. Well, so, sometimes uh, that our UN data ref follow global trends, sometimes they don't. Yes, but I think it would be interesting to um, examine the reasons why uh, some CCTLDs are growing, others are going down. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And this is our ambition too. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. But now let's move to our final speaker uh, of the session. Uh, the day didn't start to a good start. Um, I got into a traffic jam, now we lost the presentation. Well, anyway, uh, we found it, uh, it's back. Uh, anyway. Now, if you want to find out which DNS resolvers the end users are using, this is how you approach the task. What is a resolver? I think everyone knows, but just to remind everyone here on the picture, in the center, we have the resolver that uh, uh, searches uh, over uh, DNS. It's a distributed information system, and the resolver is a search tool uh, that looks for information in this uh, distributed system. It's quite uh, a, uh, a simplistic uh, scheme. Uh, it's much more complex in reality, but uh, anyway, the yeah, uh, 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 the IP address of a DNS server is uh, uploaded, is received, is the server of the resolve in which it can operate. Things are much more complex today. Sasha made a presentation yesterday. It could be a public resolver for AIDS. It could be a provider's resolver. It could be a DNS provider resolver. Uh, there are many different options and scenarios, but um, when the dot appeared, the colleagues from APNIC decided to test in the context of uh, the internet uh, segmentation to test uh, what it is that end users are using, which resolvers are they using. This is a, an outsider's look. Uh, this is how our app Nick sees it. This is your standard layout. Uh, the user uses the resolver of its own provider, the end user, and the resolver are in the same uh, autonomous system. Another possibility is when a resolver belongs to a different AS, not the AS of the end user. For instance, these two autonomous systems in the um, Russian database are labeled as Russian, well, labeled, uh, basically Yandex autonomous system could be allocated in Finland, but still in the RIPE database, it would still be marked or labeled as Russian. And so uh, all this geo labeling and uh, the rest of it, it's, uh, it's um, uh, a big uh, unresolved issue. Anyway, different countries can be uh, labeled in the RIPE database as different countries uh, and then uh, another scenario is when the user's AS is one country and the resolver uh, AS is in another country and they will be labeled accordingly. Uh, 
Pardon. Can we go back? No, no, st stop there. Another scenario is you can have a public resolver. A public resolver can be located in the same country as the user, or it can be outside of the user's country. Uh, this is a schematic uh, from APNIC, uh, APNIC Labs uh, testbed. It's the measurement platform that they use to identify the resolvers that uh, are used by the end user. So basically, it's a combination of two uh, protocols, HTTP, yes, and the DNS protocol. So, uh, I say uh, Google. Uh, uh, at Google, a script is published. It's uploaded from the HTTP server of APNIC. So, they see the proxy's IP address or the end user's IP address, and they record the IP address in the database. And the script calls the DNS resolver. And this DNS resolver calls the authoritative uh, APNIC server. And the APNIC on, its, on the authoritative server, they see the IP address of this resolver. And the end user's IP uh, can then be associated uh, with an AS, and the resolver is associated with its AS. And in the database, they see the match. Again, um, different possibilities are, uh, well, other scenarios are also possible here, but um, this is how APNIC uh, labs operate. Uh, this is the global view. Uh, like, uh, we see nothing happening much. Uh, the blues, the yellows, the reds at the top. It's they are the same autonomous system. The speaker is not using the microphone. Okay, next. Can you press the button, please? And this is how uh, Russia uh, looks like. Something happened in February last year. You can tell that, that something happened. Uh, we're not going to discuss what exactly happened, but uh, something happened. And then things changed. And then look at the bottom chart. Look at this graph. Because of the events of February last year, the number uh, of... Oh, Okay, let's put it different. The traffic goes to APNIC uh, sensors or servers diminished um, significantly uh, by an order. And then uh, there is a lot of volatility in this graph because uh, the uh, input volume of data is very small. First, we see public DNS resolvers. Then they were going down. Their share was go started to go down. And the AS is going up. Maybe this is happening because the, uh, say, Google and APNIC uh, um, uh, associate uh, IPs using a different methodology. The sensors work differently, although it's the same autonomous system, or maybe the same autonomous system. Roskomnadzor, the Russian supervisor, uh, blocks uh, resources. Here are 53 domain names that were blocked on this day. So, yeah, you can see torrents there, some uh, uh, social networks that are not very popular, but um, nothing much out of the ordinary, right? Uh, can you click it one more time? In fact, say Google as an advertising site, uh, 
it's stayed as it was. Uh, not much changed for Google. Uh, these are the curious, uh, and you see all the data are the same. If you look um, at this uh, traffic from inside Russia, but in the press release, Google wrote something like this. Google suspended ads from uh, Russian state-owned media outlets. So on the 27th, um, and the press release came out officially on March 3rd, it says that Google stopped advertising to Russia. It stopped broadca broadcasting advertisements uh, to Russia. Hence, these results from Abnik, and then how reliable, how accurate? Well, well not, not accuracy, really. Uh, that's not the right word. Uh, the data is accurate. But is this data representative? And can we use this data anywhere? Can we use the data to analyze uh, the residual traffic? Probably. But if you want to understand what Russian users are actually using, which resolvers they are addressing, this data is no longer representative. You need to look for data elsewhere. Next. Same picture here, Google, Yandex, Yandex. And APNIC doesn't include the Yandex into its statistics, like Russian uh, uh, users aren't uh, using Yandex. So uh, APNIC considers that uh, Yandex's public resolvers are not used in Russia, which looks weird, to say the least. In fact, MSK AX uh, shared uh, some data with Indata for uh, research. They we looked at the uh, log of the public log of MSK AX, and um, according to Indata, obviously the uh, original uh, data sources uh, is not us. But according to this uh, data, we've got. Uh, 5,851 ASs in Russia. As TMSKX public resolvers for all projects taken together, we see that they received uh, queries from 3,584 ASs, so that's quite representative. The percentage is pretty uh, high. The top resolvers um, in APNIC are only 136. Six uh, ASs. So the, the graphs that you saw, they are based on the data from only 136 ASs. The mesh between APNIC data and MSK data is 111 ASs. 111 ASs are the same in MSK AIX and uh, APNIC data. So basically, MSK AIX uh, sees uh, quite uh, a share of what APNIC uh, is seeing. Public resolvers service. 23 plus billion queries a day, which is, again, quite a representative number. In fact, in um, .ru, this is what Baskakova showed uh, before me, we have the statistics. Uh, in .ru, we've got about uh, 10 billion queries a day to authoritative uh, servers. Ten billion. Uh, well, uh, if uh, in reality uh, it's uh, one hundred billion, not ten billion. Uh, but if the data is uh, twenty-three billion, that means a quarter of uh, uh, all these queries. On the arcane blacklist, Roskomnadzor, the Russian supervisor, uh, on this blacklist, uh, we know that from this blacklist, we know that uh, 522,000 domains are blocked. In terms of universal acceptance, by the way, only 386,000 can be converted into UTF-8, and everything else is just they are uh, uh, coded uh, and can be uh, recoded into UTF-8. So the question is, what is blocked actually, and uh, what is not? Uh, truly blocked. It's a very busy slide, but um, you should be interested in the lines that are high and yellow. The traffic is pretty high. This AS, 
we have it in the MSK uh, IX uh, statistics and in APNIC statistics. But in, in APNIC, it will be a tiny uh, AS. They wouldn't see many of its queries to the public resolver, but in here you can see zeros. It means that the advertising module that's broadcast uh, to APNIC, their, their uh, advertising module, not out of this number of queries, zero reach that module. It may happen for different reasons, because Google is not displaying it, maybe because uh, it's, uh, the, it's done uh, via apps uh, that block advertising, but uh, the um, size of traffic that APNIC ignores is quite high. And this is the last slide of the presentation. People say that it's a quote from Mark Twain, but in fact, uh, it's, it's a quote that belongs to someone else. Uh, there are three kinds of falsehoods, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Whenever we work with the data, you have to ask yourself a question. Is the data um, applicable? Is it relevant? Is the data representative? And the third question is, do we have enough? Well, Dima was um, um, uh, sharing a story on Mass IP. If you look at uh, the measurement methodology, you'll read that it says that there should be at least 20 probes uh, to confirm that the network is on it, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so you have to have enough measurements uh, to, to ensure that the data is relevant. That's it. Very well, Pavel, thank you very much. It was a very informative presentation. Thank you. Uh, our session has come to an end. Uh, the colleagues are still available. They're here. They aren't going anywhere. So if you have any questions, please find them during the coffee break.